Hi everyone, Rami Jackson here. Thank you so much for attending the Dr. Solomon Speakers Panel. We are grateful to have all of you here for this pressing conversation. We have a wonderful lineup of mental health activists and experts here to talk about an issue that needs more coverage and more support. Black youth need our help and they need guidance in accessing mental health resources. But you can't fit a square peg in a circular hole. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. A lot of these systems weren't built to help black people and we need to fix that as well. Change is both top down and bottom up. However, let's begin with a few words of wisdom from our wonderful friend and spiritual guide, Reverend Brakeen of the Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. Thank you, Reverend, for your time and your guidance. A final special thanks to our friends at the Acoma Project, the inspirational sisters of the Theta New Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Metropolitan AME, as mentioned before, and our good friends at DC Public Schools for their support on creating this panel. Please take it away, Reverend. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Reverend Thomas Brackeen. I serve as the minister to youth and families of the historic Metropolitan AME Church of downtown Washington, DC. And I'm honored to be a part of this evening's event for two specific reasons. First, I have served in youth ministry for over the past 17 years and have served young people in different capacities for the past 25 years throughout the DC metropolitan area. It is a desire in my work to see young people striving to live a well-rounded life spiritually, physically, educationally, and as well as mentally. Sometimes we take for granted the issues and problems that our students face daily. We have a great responsibility to mentor, but more importantly, a greater responsibility to listen to them as they matriculate in life. One of the greatest opportunities that I enjoy most in my life is sitting and learning from the youth that I serve. I listen twice as much as I try to speak. And the second reason I'm honored to be here this evening is that as a 40 year old black man, over the last few years, I've had to acknowledge my own journey with my own personal mental health. It was not until three or four years ago, I had the courage to sit down with the therapist to sort through some of the things that I felt were affecting my growth as an adult. Now that I have done the self work and continue to do so, I sit here as an advocate for creating brave spaces for young people to articulate what they face, feel and endure on a day to day basis. So I hope tonight you take in this rich discussion and I hope it's transformative to those that are listening. Thank you to the staff of Our Minds Matter that has given me this opportunity to share, and I look forward to continued partnerships soon. And now we'll turn it over to our moderator, Justin. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Solomon Speakers Black Youth Minds Matter panel. As you may know, since you have joined us here virtually this evening, February is Black History Month. And a lesser known fact is that Solomon Carter Fuller was actually the first African-American psychiatrist. That too is the namesake of our panel tonight. Dr. Fuller made several discoveries in the field of Alzheimer's research and his impact on the scientific and medical communities might not be widely known, but it's definitely widely impactful. In his honor, we gather here tonight virtually to discuss the journey, impact, and also the importance of black youth mental health. My name is Justin Graves and I'm founder and owner of He's on Wheels. I've absolutely just been so excited for this panel. I consider it an honor and a privilege to be here. I've partnered with Our Minds Matter many times over the years and it's just incredible work that they're doing as an organization. So thank you to the Our Minds Matter staff for helping organize this panel here tonight. My organization's work focuses on disability advocacy, community engagement and social inclusion. Tonight's panel will likely focus on that third piece the most, social inclusion. In recent years, there have been a lot of conversations around mental health and honestly, they've become more, um, or excuse me, they've become less exclusive and more inclusive, which is great. Our Minds Matter has a mission to decrease the stigma around these conversations. And we hope that tonight's panel will not only do that, but that it will also remind us of why conversations around mental health of black youth are so important and so necessary. So just a couple of logistics and kind of housekeeping items before we get started. Throughout tonight's panel, I invite you to write your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar. If you're using a laptop, you might be able to access that button on the bottom of your screen. If your question is for a specific panelist, please write their name along with your question. For any general comments or agreements or affirmations, 
please also use the chat function to dialogue with other participants. First, we're going to start with getting to know the panelists a little bit better, you know, so you can kind of figure out why we're all here tonight and what presentation or excuse me, what perspective we're bringing with, um, with our thoughts today. So I would love to go around the virtual room and ask the panelists to share a little bit about why they do what they do and also share why they chose their particular hype up song. So those are the two questions, um, what you do, why you do it, and why is um, whichever song you chose your hype up song. You, you all already know who I am and um, I do what I do because I, I love people, I love community and inclusion. And my hype up song is Nonstop by Ham from Hamilton. Um, if you've ever seen the Hamilton musical, you might know that Nonstop is the last song at the end of act one. And it's basically a medley. So it's kind of a cheat answer. You get all the songs wrapped into one there. Um, so up next, um, let me turn it over to Sepla to share why um, Feels Like Summer is her, uh, by Childish Gambino is her hype up song and why she does what she does. Hey y'all. So um, as Justin mentioned, um, I'm Sepla. I am a senior in high school in uh, North Virginia and also the club leader at my school's um, All Minds Matter chapter called Rams Minds Matter. I am, I thought really, really um, am glad to be able to get to know the Our Minds Matter team and extend their um, message of trying to encourage like my peers to, in, to um, start having more honest and I get this more brave conversations because I feel like having that kind of space within like my school community has meant so much to me and it means a lot when I get to see my friends as well as new faces learn how to do the same. My uh, my hype hop song is It Feels Like Summer um, by Childish Gambino. And I just kind of picked it out because I love the vibe. It's the kind of song I feel like I can just kind of like do anything to. I like having like background music in my head when I'm just like going through my day. Helps like keep keep me going. And also this is, I'm, I really love drawing. <laughs> I'm really into art and animation and I love the music video. I really enjoyed the artists and I even like, I ended up following the animator <laughs> for that music video. So yeah. That's great, Stefla. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just so you all know, if you um, saw any of the fantastic artwork um, that was associated with tonight's event, that was Stefla. So she's not kidding when she says she loves drawing and she's really good at it too. All right, up next, let's go over to um, Jordan. Jordan Burnham, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Um, really happy to be here and honored to be on here with everyone um, and, and share my perspective. So my name is Jordan Burnham. I've been a public speaker on uh, my story, mental health and suicide prevention over the last 12 years. And then I'm also in my second year of being director of student engagement over at uh, the organization I speak for, Minding Your Mind. Uh, why do what I do? I think that in, in order to break the stigma associated with anything, but especially mental health, I think the best way to do that is by sharing our stories and using our voice to speak on the subjects that a lot of people feel uncomfortable talking about. So I always hope that by sharing my story and, and speaking on this subject, it helps um, people feel as though they're not alone, but also feel empowered to be able to share their story and share their own experiences and know that what they're feeling and what they're going through is valid. Um, so that's why I do, you know, what I do. And then as far as my um, song, it was Aretha Franklin, um, Happy Blues. The reason I love this song so much is because one of my favorite things to say is that you can have two emotions at the same time. And I think Aretha just does such a beautiful job in this song of saying, things aren't perfect, I'm not perfect, but I'm still going to sing, I'm still going to dance. And I feel like a lot of times that's what I need is even if I can admit things aren't perfect right now and I might be struggling, I can still sing, I can still dance, I can still do the things that keep me happy and keep me going. Uh, so that's why I chose that as my song. That was great. Jordan, thank you so much. Up next, let's toss it over to Dr. Alfie Breland Noble. Dr. Alfie, take it away. One. It's so nice to be here. Um, my name is Dr. Alfie Breland Noble. Everybody calls me Dr. Alfie. I have been in this space of uh, working on young people's mental health way before it was cool. Um, when I was having arguments in academic settings, um, talking with people about when they ask questions like, well, how is young people's mental health any different than anybody else's? And in particular, how is the mental health of young people of color any different from anybody else's? And my argument was always the same. 
we can't answer that question because we haven't studied enough to understand what these young people's needs are. And we have not asked enough young people what their needs are for us to fully understand what they want, desire, and need from us to support them. So that has been my mission and vision for over 20 years, because you know, I started when I was 10. That's a joke. But um, in the 20 plus years that I've been doing this work, I turned my research lab from academic medicine in departments of psychiatry at Duke and most recently at Georgetown to something called the ACOMA Project, which is a proud co-partner for this event tonight. And at the ACOMA Project, we're about three things, raising consciousness, empowering people, and changing the system, all within the space of supporting just who we're talking about tonight, Black children, young, uh, young children of color, young people of color, I'm sorry, uh, primarily teenagers and young adults. So I'm all about it. And my high song is Grown Woman by Beyonce, because I'm part of the hive and I love me some, some bae. And because I'm a grown woman and I can do whatever I want. So that's my hype song. And that's why I picked it. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Let me just say that I'm really happy that my camera goes off when everyone else speaks because I was cracking up that whole time, Dr. <laughs> Alfie. I'm waiting for my Ivy Park shipment um, from the last drop right now. Yes. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much um, for sharing about the incredibly important work that you're doing. Um, and also really great microphone. I was just listening to your podcast. Um, so, so your voice sounds so familiar um, in, in that tone. Hey. Um, <laughs> all right, let's um, toss it over to Dr. Kristen Carruthers. Um, I think uh, Dr. Carruthers, your hype song was one of my favorites, Just Fine by Mary J. Blige. I was yes. popping it out all afternoon. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about your work and how you chose that song. Okay, well, thank you all for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of the panel. I'm even more excited to know that there are fellow members of the Hive present tonight who are also passionate about mental health for uh, all people, but for Black youth in particular. I'm Dr. Kristen Carruthers. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. And the reason I do what I do is that from a young age, I've seen a lot in terms of uh, the impact of stress, trauma, um, and injustice on Black youth in particular, and always felt that it was my role or my job to do something about it. And I found clinical psychology is one of the ways to, to do that clinical and community work. And so I'm presently um, a forensic psychologist in the state of Georgia working with juveniles who have been arrested or who have charges. And I also work in private practice with children, adolescents and adults who are experiencing difficulty coping with stressors that um, come in life. Uh, I chose my hype, hype song, Mary J. Blige, Just Fine, because she's the first artist that I can remember truly loving. Um, and uh, her music has always resonated with me. But this song in particular, I like because no matter what my mood is, and I, I like how... Um, uh, I think it was Jordan said, we have two feelings at once. I love how I can be in one mood and hear that song and it totally switches my mindset. Um, and I also appreciate her journey as a woman and she's someone I look up to. So that's why Just Fine is my hype song. And I'm just really happy to be here. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Carruthers. Appreciate that. All right, let's round out our introductions and kind of get to know you session here with um, Nigel Jackson. Nigel, take it away. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Nigel Jackson. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker in Washington, D.C., and I am the director of school mental health for D.C. public schools. So why do I do what I do? When I was a young person, of course, I was going to change the world. Isn't that what we're, we're all gonna do? I was going to change everything that wasn't right. And I was gonna do it in about one year because it would probably take me a year or two. So I became a social worker to change the conditions that were not right in the world. And um, I wanted to help people. And I learned how to help people. I started learning why there needed to be help. And over time, I learned more and more and more and more. And then I was like, wait a minute. It's not only other people that need help. I need some help too. 
So I started learning more and more and more about my needs and the things that I needed to help within myself. So it started out by me trying to learn how to help other people. And then it grew into also how I can learn more about myself. And my hype up song is um, Grow Food by um, Appetite for Change. And the song is my hype up song because it has a great beat and it's done by young people. So anybody who's unfamiliar, especially young people, YouTube, Grow Food. Thank you so much, Nigel. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I was listening to that song for the first time earlier and I was not aware, but now I am. So <laughs> thanks for introducing me to sure. that. Okay, all right. Thank you everyone for um, really talking about this amazing, fantastic work that you're all doing, um, especially in support of Black youth mental health. Of course, as we all know, that's the topic of our conversation tonight. So really, let's just let's just go ahead and jump right in. So I've got some questions that we've kind of drafted together here. But um, again, a friendly reminder to all of you that are watching, no matter how you're watching, you can drop some questions into the chat. And um, I'm just here to kind of facilitate and guide the conversation and the direction that it, it may go. So the first question, just to kind of get us really rolling here tonight, is um, I want to ask this of all of the panelists, is what do you think is the single most challenging thing about being a Black person, specifically when it comes to seeking uh, mental health support and mental health overall? Dr. Crothers, go okay, for it. So, um, I think one of the toughest things um, is that seeking mental health support hasn't always been like normalized in our community. And so there's been this, um, this idea that if you were to speak with someone outside of your family or outside of your religious institution, that you're almost breaking an unspoken rule or a spoken rule, which is we don't share our business with other people, or that you have to be crazy to need support. There's got to be something wrong with you. Um, and so I think that one piece is the cultural piece. I think the second piece is whether or not we feel like we are seen or represented in the mental health field. So how easy is it going to be for me to find a Black therapist or a Black male therapist? And I know especially for Black men, that can be really challenging. I get um, questions lots from parents. I need a, t uh, a therapist that's a Black man for my teenage son. And I say, wow, you know, and, and it's a struggle to provide those types of to linkages. And so I think there's this issue where now um, we are embracing the fact that it is okay to seek support outside of your family or your reference group. But then on the flip side is where are there providers who people feel comfortable with based on culture, based on gender, based on uh, sexual orientation or other aspects of identity. Those are some really good points. I'm curious, maybe um, Dr. Alfie, as a psychologist, um, do any of those points maybe resonate with you in terms of, you know, uh, helping folks who are black find um, mental health support from people that look like them? Of course. Um, so my colleague, Dr. Carruthers is, is spot on. Um, there's not much I can add to what she said. Uh, I think the only thing I can say is from a researcher's perspective that a lot of the treatments that are available to us don't feel like they resonate with us because they were not developed by us. Um, and by us, I mean black folk and people of color and by black, I mean all of us of the, the beautiful diaspora. So whether that's African, um, I'm looking at Sibla, um, knowing that her origins are on the continent that she can tie herself to. Uh, my, I'm gonna make an assumption about Dr. Carruthers, origins are there as well, but I'm not 100% sure where because of the legacy of slavery. Uh, though I do know my DNA is, so all my Nigerian people out there, um, I know my DNA is Nigerian in part. Um, and so I think that because of these, the, the differences that we exhibit as black people, when we talk about black, I'm talking about all of us, including my black Latinx brothers and sisters. Um, and so those, those differences, uh, the uniqueness of our experience in the United States specifically has not always and has frequently been uh, ignored 
as a part of the profession that I work in. Uh, We just have to own that. But there have been people along the way who have really tried to force the conversation for us as Black folks, right? So I think about Dr. Bill Cross and his nigrescence theory. These are things that I wasn't necessarily taught once I got to graduate school, but I'm an HU grad, Howard University, HU, you know. Um, And I see my bison over here. I know I like Dr. Carruthers. See, we good now. She a bison. And so I think, uh uh-oh, Nigel too. See, like we taking over. Y'all need to recognize. So it's that those aspects of psychology and the mental health field, counseling, social work, I think social work has been much better about these things in some other fields, I have to admit. But a part of it is also, in addition to the lack of representation by the people who are the purveyors of the work, it is also the lack of representation and the lack of putting forth of theories and practices that are specific to our experiences. So the last thing I'll say is that there was a time, believe it or not, for all my young folks out there, anybody sort of under 30, before your time, it was difficult for people to say things like racial trauma and be taken seriously, right? So when I came along in the early 90s, you didn't talk about that. Like to say that there was racist trauma was like, oh, you're you're bringing up bad stuff. And now, thank God for millennials and Gen X and Gen Z, I'm sorry, you talk about these things a lot, which normalizes it, which allows us to bring it out into the open. So kudos to you for that. But I would also say that the theories and practices that we've traditionally used, with the exception of a few people, um, Linda James Myers and uh, toward an Afrocentric worldview, outside of those brave folks who put those things out there, it's been really challenging for Black people to find people who understand our unique experiences, um, particularly as a whole diaspora of folks. Jordan, you want to chime in? Go ahead, Nigel. I saw you. Go ahead. I wanted to just share something that um, came to me when Dr. Alfie was speaking, and that is um, when she mentions that a lot of the theories in for clinicians that we study in school or were not developed by us, um, I just wanted to kind of follow up on that and, and to say that uh, Black people are people of rhythm and spirit and the 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 modalities that we get trained in are antithetical to that they're mechanistic they're void of spirit they're void of rhythm they're void of love and feeling and um um there's a a person who i studied in graduate school uh his name is dr shealy and he has this one thing I remember, he, I, I will never forget this. He said, affective knowledge is epistemologically valid. Now, Sebla, you, my children are your age, and I'm so impressed that you're on this panel. And I know there's other young people listening. So I, those words are just like little fancy words they use in graduate schools, but I'm going to break them down, okay? Affective knowledge is epistemologically valid, is a fancy way of saying what you feel is real. Okay, what you feel is real. And I remember I I memorized those words because I didn't have the words to put to the feelings that I had when I was in school, when they would shut me down for saying the things I said. So I used to say back to the, well, affective knowledge is epistemologically valid because I was like, these are your fancy words. I'm going to use your fancy words against y'all. But I think what that speaks to is the point that Dr. Alfie was making and and the point that I'm trying to make is that when we ask why don't Black people seek treatment or why do, why do, why is there a stigma in our community? I want to reframe that because when we say that, we put the onus on Black people. We're the ones who are the sufferers of racism, white supremacy. So the question isn't why do they... Um, like, you know how you always hear that thing? Like, why did they do that to us? Because we're black. Let's reverse that to, well, what sickness is in you that would make you want to do that to black people, right? So we have to start asking the questions and telling the story, not from a position of oppress, of oppression, but from a position of strength. So like as a black male therapist and clinician, I hear from my colleagues and friends all the time. Hey, can you talk to my son? Can you talk to my husband? Can you do this and that? Right. And I remember as, as a clinician, one, um, like one of the first things I do is we throw the football, you know, or we'll go, you know, we'll do something. 
because movement, just like rhythm and spirit and expression, this is a part of how Black people relate to each other. So um, I would say if, if you're a parent on this call and you're looking for how to get support for a family member, if you're a young person and you want to find somebody, that it's okay to find someone who has a vibe similar to yours. It's okay. And you don't have to find somebody that doesn't speak like you. Or if you get that feeling in you, that's like, eh, something about this just don't feel right. Trust it and trust your intuition. And there are people that you do get a different vibe from that you're more comfortable with. Because if you don't feel safe, your conversation and your session is meaningless. So I um I scared my cat because I'm I'm snapping my fingers at everything. <laughs> Everyone's saying, "Man, this is this is great." Um, you know, for me, when I think about this question, I appreciate this and I love this conversation. Um, I think for me, what can be the most difficult is to articulate the black experience of living in America, um, especially being a black man. Because when I say the Black experience, I mean not only the way that I see the world, but especially the way the world in America sees me. And so for me, I think that can be incredibly difficult because at no point in our history of this country has America looked to Black people and said, we're all ears. Tell us about your pain. Tell us about your sadness. And then here are the resources so that you can get better and stronger as a community. You know, that is something that has lacked, and it's, it's hard to be able to explain that to people, even the people that you go to high school with, middle school with. Something that I found out over the summer is that myself and a lot of my friends that went to high school who are Black, we talked about how we were feeling during a lot of the injustices that were occurring over and over again. And people I went to high school with said, well, you don't really feel that way. I went to high school with you. Like, I, I know what neighborhood you grew up in. And, and it was just such a clear reminder that to know my experience is not to know my Black experience. And until I have the opportunity to share that, it's hard to get to the core of mental health as far as what I'm feeling, what I'm processing it, and then how I'm getting help. That is the entire part of being Black in America is not only expressing how you're feeling, but then sometimes educating on oppression and intersectionality and why that's affecting you to the way that it is. And then when you see something on your timeline, you have to explain to a person how many times you've gotten that text from your boy saying, did you see this video? Did you hear what the police said? Did you, those are ongoing conversations happening over and over again. And that is something that yes, that's the part of being black that's hard to describe, but also I'll never be able to describe the joy of getting into the barbershop and just being around the men that I grew up with, you know, as a kid. I'll never be able to describe the feeling of walking into church and the joy that you feel and the people who talk about their pain, their sadness, the things that they struggle with, depression. And so I'll never be able to explain some of the, yes, those darker parts of being black in America, but also too, there's a black joy that I truly, truly love and embrace about our community that is also hard to articulate. But at the same time, I cherish that. And um, I would say if there's anything that's hard about speaking on mental health, seeking treatment, it's that I have to first explain to you my experience before you can truly understand where my pain and sadness stems from. Goosebumps. Absolutely. Dr. Just, Crothers, please. I just want to, Jordan, everything you said. Um, but the one piece, first, I want to do like a process comment. What I noticed that um, is different than other panels that I've been on, uh, where there have been different people of different cultural backgrounds, is that when there is something that is said that we either feel that affective experience, um, we're nodding, we're affirming each other. And sometimes when you are, well, not sometimes, but many times when you are in spaces that are not black as a black, a person from the diaspora in the United States, you don't get that type of feedback or that validation. And so you don't know if your experience is an experience that's shared by others. 
what you said, Jordan, you just because you know my experience does not mean you know my black experience. I think it's eloquent. Um, and I'm sure you'll get to this, Justin, but there is a question about how is black youth mental health different from white youth mental health. You also mentioned that when somebody, when, when the video comes out, you've seen it 15 times. You've gotten 10 text messages about it. It's been on Facebook. Uh, there was an article in the Huffington Post today that says social media is traumatizing us. Well, think about being a black person in America just over the last six months and how many times you've seen videos or you've seen a clip that's a black history clip that's supposed to wake us up that has inundated you with the thought that things, though they change, tend to remain the same. And so being able to like find that joy that you're talking about in these sacred spaces, the barbershop, the religious institution, the church, the being with your friends is really important right now because it can feel so dark. Um, sometimes when you listen to music and you think, okay, well, within our own community, there are things going on and with outside of our community, there are things that are happening to us and does this get better? And so trying to shift that attention or shift that focus to, but where do we find joy? I think is really important. So thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, and I, I wanted to reference one of the comments that I see in the chat, actually, um, that ties in both with what you were just saying, Jordan, and you as well, Dr. Carruthers, is talking about how it's so much harder, um, not only when you're not in spaces that are validating you, but when you are met with invalidation by others, especially by those that don't understand your experience, right? And so I read that and that just, that hit, that resonated really deeply. But um, going back to what you said, Dr. Crothers, um, and so while we're here, let's just jump into, um, you know, that notion of how is, um, you know, and that was a question that was in the chat is, um, what are some ways that Black youth mental health differs from white or other youth mental health? Um, and I think, you know, maybe we can, um, everyone who would like to chime in, maybe take that from two different perspectives, maybe one perspective that is a little more superficial. Um, so let's, let's state the obvious here, you know, like, let's not gloss over things, given our audience, let's say, okay, well, this is what we think is obvious in, in this circle, but then also maybe some of those deeper nuanced things as well. Um, so anyone who would like to maybe take a stab at that. I'm voting for Sebla. I'm a, I'm a voluntold you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy you did it. I kind of wanted to as well. Sebla, please, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Right. So I guess the difference between, I would guess, then growing up Black in America versus like, say, not being Black or being like the white kid in America, I would say it's something that I like to kind of want to, want to touch on what was mentioned earlier. You don't exactly describe, right? There's a sense of community and unity, which you grow up with and you appreciate and you love, but there's also a sense of isolation almost in that it can... Hmm, and that especially when it comes to discussing saying like there are a lot of messages was even within you know when you when you like to talk to like say like your white friends like in class they, they are raised with these expectations of who you are supposed to be like you're supposed to be like that black friend or like that black kid in your class I think especially with me and having parents who you know wanted me to be like an overachiever it was it was kind of even um, exemplified because I was often like the the only black kid in the class, right? And so you're you you enter into these large spaces, you know, because school is such a so, uh, especially like a place where you spend a lot of your time. These social spaces, always facing all of these labels and expectations that people just kind of put on you that you maybe didn't realize were going to happen into because because it's not like with your family. It's something that you have to suddenly navigate and you start that from a young age and you have to almost shape a new identity in order to confront yourself, whether that's with code switching, whether that's with trying to change how you dress or how you speak, how you present yourself, especially to different communities and trying to navigate those spaces. I think that can create a sense of grief, especially in your youth since you know being young, that's a time period where you're supposed to be developing your identity, right? So when you feel like you are Black and in America and having to navigate so many spaces that don't necessarily want your true self or want for you to explore your needs or your identity, that can be so challenging and difficult, especially I would think for people for like say that maybe your white friend simply just cannot relate to. <laughs> um, adding on, um, 
yeah, I would think that would probably be the biggest difference in the context of mental health. There's also, you know, I truly believe that within the Black community, there are maybe even if it's not, if things like racial trauma or things like abuse, if those things maybe not, might not be expressed vocally, I, do, I truly do feel like the community has a very strong and unique way of still confronting those issues through the support and the love that maybe that has allowed our communities to be so strong like to this day for so many years. And I think that's also something that I'm grateful for and something that definitely I would say sets us apart. <laughs> You're getting some silent applause there, Sephla. <laughs> Anyone else like to chime in on that particular question, Jordan? I, I would just add so that as I listened to Sebla speak to her experience, mom, her daughter, she, I was going to say her daughter, Freudian slip. My daughter is this about the same age as Sebla. She's a junior um, in public schools in Northern Virginia. And I my it breaks my heart because while I see this, incredibly articulate, beautiful, inside and out young woman speaking. I'm also pained by the universality of that experience for our black girls and our black boys. Um, there's a book, I don't know if people can see it on my uh, panel right here, it's called The Black Kids. And I had the author on my podcast and the author is probably, she's a millennial. So she's probably in her thirties. And the book is about a black girl during the Rodney King riot, riots who lives uprising, excuse me, who lives in a affluent, very white neighborhood and is wrestling with exactly the same things that Sebla is talking about, being the only black girl in this wealthy enclave. She doesn't really have any other black people in her so social circle and it's navigating all of that, which is identical to, right? I said she was a millennial, the author, um, Christina Hammonds Reed. I'm Gen X. That was my experience growing up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm from the same hometown as Pharrell and Chad Hugo, the Neptunes. They grew up about, I don't know, probably seven or eight miles from me. Um, Timberland, Tim Timothy Mosley literally grew up maybe like three miles from me. That was our experience. And we're all Gen X. And to know that it went from Gen X to millennials to Gen Z, and my daughter's going through exactly the same thing. That to me is that intergenerational trauma. So the, the benefit is that my daughter can look to me because that's the same kind of environment I grew up in. Same thing, only black kid in the class. It was like eight of us and some Filipino kids. It was like 10 of us total. Um, and you're it, right? Like you're always it. And I, I felt, part of me felt, my heart felt a little heavy because I thought, and it didn't change once I got out of undergrad. My oasis was Howard for four years. I was there with Puffy and all them people and the Hitman and all that. That was heaven for four years. And then I got out and it was right back to the same thing. And so it's this constant, I think about Du Bois and double consciousness. And I think about we wear the mask. It is constant. And so if we don't acknowledge the weight of that, day to day. I love what Jordan said about you don't know my black people pain. You know pain, but you don't know my black people pain, right? And I think even within our community, I might know my African-American pain, but that's different than Somalian immigrant pain. That's different than Jamaican immigrant pain. Like it's different. There's some things that are universal, but there's some things that are different. And so, or even folks, my black brothers and sisters with disabilities, right? Stuff that we never talk about or my queer black brothers and sisters and non-gender conforming. So I just think the heaviness of it, while I'm encouraged because like the kids are all right. When I listen to several, I'm like, okay, the kids are all right. I can, I can let go of the wheel, let the kids drive, right? They got it. It just pains me that, you know, you have all these generations who are literally experiencing, it's just identical things in different eras. Um, and that makes me sad because, um, you know, things change but there's some things that, that still say the same. Why are there still only one or two of us in these advanced classes? That's ridiculous, that's systemic. There are more than one or two of us who deserve to be in those classes, but there are only one or two of us because these weed out processes. So um, I just, I'm, she's so eloquent. I'm just so like, I'm like, oh, mic drop. I wish I had a mic, I would drop it. Cause she, well, this one's cheap, but it was expensive so I can't break it, but she was awesome. Um, and I just, it just, it really does break my heart that, that these are things that are still weighing on our young people. Um, it's, it's a lot. Absolutely. That, that hits because I hear a lot of, you know, conversations around intersectionality, what you're referencing there and, you know, other social identities along with blackness, you know, whether it's ability, whether it's sexual identity, gender, et cetera. And those 
those issues just they stack on top of each other um and, and it makes it not not any easier for anyone to deal with jordan looked like you might you um, have no. a thought yeah no um everything that was just said was was, was amazing and i loved hearing Subla just to be able to speak on some of the, and i'm nodding my head because the the generational trauma that that gets passed down in the situation that gets passed down is something that um, I, I can relate to, my parents can relate to. Um, when I describe the experience of, you know, I said to one of my colleagues, when's the last time you were the only white person in the room? Restaurant, classroom, anything. Uh, and they could come up with one time. And, and they, they said just how self-conscious they felt and yeah, my response was, well, that's a Wednesday for us. So that's, that's just something we're used to of looking around and saying, I'm the only person in this room, which not only does it feel lonely, but that's a lot of pressure. You're carrying the weight of the black community on your back in that classroom. Because the one thing I always felt in the back of my mind from a kid going through middle school, high school, especially, I need to prove I belong. I can't just get B's. I, I can't get C's. I need to prove that I belong here. You know, I played golf. There were times I was the only black person on the golf course that day in a match. I made sure that my shoes were cl like clean. I made sure I had my, my golf clubs look good. I had to make sure my shirt was tucked in because I had to be what we call black excellence, right? And there's a reason why we say that because there are many times in America where we have to be excellent just to prove we belong. And there's an internal pressure that you feel, not only in school, but then going through college, then at your job. And always having to deal with that is something I'm glad that we brought up because as soon, again, everything that we're saying right now, I'm just nodding my head like, yes, yes, because it's something that I feel, something that I've experienced. But to hear someone else say it, there's like this sigh of relief of like, I'm not the only one. Hundred um, percent. So I hope the um, OMM staff doesn't get mad at me for doing this, but I'm actually going to pull a question from the chat that isn't in the Q and A just yet because it it hits just everything that we're talking about right now. Um, and so the question is, um, could you all speak to the imposter syndrome and code switching that occurs when we are the only black person in professional settings? And I'll I'll just take moderator's privilege to adjust that to academic settings as well. Um, so code switching, imposter syndrome. I know Sepwa, you mentioned um, code switching a little bit, but maybe if someone would like to maybe define that in case that's not a universal term that um, everyone's familiar with, and then let's dive into that question. I see Dr. Alfie scratching her ear. <laughs> and so I want to, I'm not going to interpret it right now, but um, I'm happy to take the um the question and anybody else who wants to come off mute and jump in with me, I have no problem with sharing this. This is a shared experience for Black people, so I think we should share the answer to this question. Um, code switching is the process by which you recognize that you have to present a different self dependent on the situation you're in. Most often for Black people, that occurs, as Jordan said, when we are in settings where we are either um, in the minority, meaning there are more um, white people than black people. And where there's this perception, or I think it's something that we pass down through the generations that we are representing the race and it is our job to represent the race to the best of our ability that comes out of that Du Bois, um, the talented 10th. Okay, so uh, W.E.B. Du Bois had a, a concept that there was a talented 10th. So a 10th of black people were gonna be the ones who were gonna push the race forward. And so that black excellence, that concept comes from that. And that's what I learned at Howard. Like this is why I was at Howard University and, I, and, and that's what I learned there. I had never heard of this before that, but I had been one of the only black kids in a classroom before that. I had been the only one or two in an honors class before that. Um, but didn't understand what the pressure was that I felt that wasn't spoken. And so my language changes, my, my posture may change, the things that I'm willing to share about myself may also change. So my presentation is different, right? And then when I'm in a setting that is perhaps all black, I may also code switch depending on the class of people that I'm with or lots of different factors, but primarily code switching is the process by which you leave a white world and you go back to your black world at night. You leave your black world, you go back to your, uh, your white world during the day. Um, and so 
I'm going to share this. This is a personal experience for me, but I left New York City about two years ago. I uh, previously worked at a uh, very prestigious mental health organization where I was uh, one of the only clinicians of color. And I love my clients, whoever they are, but I got to the point where I was working on Park Avenue and I was living on 137th Street. And if anybody here has been to New York or is familiar with that dichotomy, Park Avenue, I was one block from Trump Tower. When I'm on 137th Street, I was across from Harlem Hospital. I was living in two different worlds constantly for about an eight year period. I, I loved Harlem. From at, When I got to New York, I thought, no, I wanna live on the Upper West Side. I needed to be in Harlem because at the end of the day, I was working in all white spaces where I was not gonna be a firm, where I was gonna spend my whole day code switching and proving to people that I had earned my PhD and I knew what I was talking about. I had a, a, a person who was a supervisor say, oh, you're smart. They were surprised by my response to something. This was not at that prestigious organization. I'm not saying that. this was at another prestigious organization. But, oh, you're smart. Uh, oh, what do your parents do? Oh, so all of these questions to figure out why do I deserve to be in the space that I'm in, right? And that gets to be exhausting. But it's something we learn to do as Black people because you can't move up in academia. Well, it's very difficult. Dr. Alfie should speak to this. You can't move up in academia or move up in the work world often if you are not able to effectively code switch. What does this do to your mental health? Okay, so if you're constantly in a position where during the day, Park Avenue, end of the day, you're coming uptown and you're noticing like how hard you're working just to make it, to then go back downtown to have people to try to prove your worth to people downtown, right? Um, it is, it's exhausting. I'm gonna stop now because I'm oversharing, but I just want you all to know that like, it's um, it's a thing. It's not a fiction of our, a, fi uh, a figment of our imagination. It is real, it's documented. Um, the imposter syndrome goes along with that. So once you've been, you get, you get all these messages saying like, you don't really deserve to be here. Or, How'd you get here? What do your parents do? Or are you, the, are you one of the black girls? Like black girls are supposed to be this way. Then when you're in these positions, you start to think, well, do I really deserve to be here? Maybe I'm not as smart as they are. Cause you know, they say I've got to be my best self to even compete with them. So when you're in these positions, you think, ah, oh, I may not be as good as them somebody's gonna find me out. And when they find me out, what are they gonna do to me? So that intergenerational transmission, transmission of dysfunction comes in. So the, the lies and things that were pumped into our heads over generations start to come out. We're not good enough. We're not the same as them. We don't learn as quickly. We don't test as well, right? And so when you get into spaces where you really belong, you think you don't belong. I want to tell all the all of our everybody young to me. I want to tell all the young people a quick story. This is what um, my brother, not my head's nodding to my brother Nigel when we talk about uh, supremacy, white supremacy. This is the myth and the fantasy that we're sold, and that sometimes unknowingly and unwittingly we buy into because we're socialized this way, right? And so, to the quick story is this: as an academic, there's this holy grail of grants. The grants come from an organization called the National Institutes of Health, all right? NIH, that's, that's the big money. If you get NIH funding, just in the academic world, you are like king, queen, you're like it. There's a particular one called an R, I don't know if it's an O or a zero, forever, we just say R01, all right? It's an R01. The R01 is money that you get that the federal government gives you. It all comes from taxpayer dollars. So if you working and you paying taxes, you pay for the NIH. The, long, the short of the story is to get an R01 is a huge deal, right? It kind of sets you up for your academic career. That's like becoming the manager at the restaurant or becoming a regional manager. It's like, you, that's the holy grail. Um, when we talk about imposter syndrome and we talk about black excellence, um, there are two things. One is that African-American black investigators have a statistically significantly lower chance in their career of ever getting an R01, even when all things are equal between black investigators and white investigators. You have to know that because it means that the system 
is flawed. It's not you. It's the system. That's one. The second thing, let's talk about imposter syndrome. The next time you worry about, am I good enough? Remember this story that Dr. Alfie said. I had a white peer. He was a year younger than me and had finished his degree a year before a year after I did. So he was, he was a year older than me, I'm sorry, and had finished his degree a year after me. He got an R01 before I ever got an R01, but let me tell you how he got it, which I found out later. His mentor, who was also my mentor, wrote the grant and earned it. Let's call his mentor Jack Smith. Jack, after a year, decided to retire. He gave his R01 to the other person. We were both his mentees. Do you understand what that means? That means that that person's first giant holy grail grant was not something that he earned. It was literally handed to him. So the next time you think that there's somebody out there who's smarter than you, who knows more than you, who's had more advantages than you, I want you to remember there are forces out there that are literally handing them things on platters that you're having to work for. Don't forget that. And don't ever feel like you have to be more or better. You just, what I want you to hear me say, you just need to be you. That's enough. Who you are is enough, period. And don't ever forget that. I just have to jump in because I have the same story in a, from a clinical perspective. What you are saying is, I mean, it's dead on. I've had colleagues make $100,000 more than me and be at the same exact level of training. You know what that will do to you as an and as a person when you, you're like, what? And if you don't ever get that backstory, then it will like confirm these myths of, of superiority. There's always a backstory and it involves a platter like Dr. Alfie said. And it's important that we acknowledge that. And I feel like this is the first year, like you said, Dr. Dr. Alfie, that has ever been like this acknowledgement that there is systemic oppression, like that there, like this is a setup. Um, there were things I used to talk about with people in graduate school and they say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm black. And I know that there are things that have happened to disenfranchise black people consistently. Um. I wanted to uh, wanted to add to Dr. Carruthers um, and Dr. Alfie's statements. So this is talked about a little little less, but I'm I'm in Washington D.C. I live for those in the D.M.V. area. I live in Bowie. Okay, so my neighborhood is all black folks. The neighborhood next to me is all black folks. I work with all black folks, my mechanic, the pediatrician, everybody, okay? It's a very unique part of the country where that experience is, you know, where it's like that. And I think that it is very important to do exactly what Dr. Crothers and Dr. Alfie shared, right? Where you were learning that there's more to the story. These people are not just superior to you. They're not, they don't just know more or they don't just have more. There's something behind it. And if you don't learn what that is, you will attribute it to that they're just more intelligent or maybe deep in, in the deeper recesses of your mind that they are more godly than you because they look like the image your great grandma has of Jesus on the wall, right? But I think there's a little, there's, a, there's another part of that that I wanna share with some of the young people listening too. There was a, a, a brother named um, Neely Fuller Jr., right? And he's another name that I, I'll put it in the chat, but I want you to look him up. And he said, if you don't understand racism, white supremacy, all else will confuse you. And I say that because if you don't understand why those people, how they got that M01 grant, what's it called? The M R01 grant. If you don't understand why they're getting a hundred thousand dollars more for the same job, you'll attribute it to the wrong things. Okay, but only slightly less talked about is within our own people, we get and treated, we treat each other just as poorly, 
right? So I'm looking, I see, look at us on the panel. We got all the different complexions, right? From chocolate all the way to light brown. And I'm sure the, the ones of us with more melanin been mistreated by our own people called ugly and stupid and dirty. The ones of us with lighter complexion been called white and, you know, all, we, to, by each other. <laughs> I'm talking about by our own families, right? So I say that to say, if you don't understand why your own people and your own family is going to mistreat you and hurt you and hurt your feelings and cause pain, it'll have the same effect as if you don't understand your experiences, your adverse experiences in the white world as well. So if you don't understand the effect of racism, white supremacy, then you're going to misattribute your negative experiences and you won't be able to develop the positive sense of self that you're going to need to consider yourself whole and you'll have a delayed self-concept there's a um, one thing i always remember that i want to share i see we're running up on time justin i know you're probably looking at the clock but i feel like this is important to say is that um you can't separate racism from mental health it's not separate so I know we, we always try to get to the question like, well, what can I do? What can I do to start dialogue? What can I do to create a different environment for my colleagues? I, I understand that. But I really believe that for Black people, we have to um, really define what racism is. And I'm not talking about Google and I'm not talking about Merriam-Webster's dictionary. I would recommend that everybody look at Dr. Francis Cress Welsing's definition of racism. Um, I'm not gonna go into it now, but I, I really would like everybody to use that because you have to understand what it is because like, like um, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture said, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. But if he thinks he has the power to lynch me, that's my problem. He's underscoring that racism isn't an individual attitude. And that's how we get sold through movies and this other stuff. Racism is a local and global power dynamic system. And when something is a system, that means that an individual attitude is just this infinitesimal piece of sand. It's a grain of sand on a large, large beach, right? So for us, I think when we look at a system, of racism, white supremacy, it lets you consider the bigness of the system, the powerlessness that black people feel within a large structure and powerless is directly connected to grief, trauma, pain, every mental health condition you could think of. So you can't separate them. So I, I just wanna, if I could leave you one thing is to not separate racism, white supremacy from mental health. And these Incredible. scholars that are on this uh, panel and on this chat uh, that we've put in here, read them and study them so you can have a better understanding of a healthy self-concept for, for a Black person. Incredible. So well said, Nigel. So well said. I love your imagery as well. Um, so, of course, I'm, you're right. I'm looking at the clock. It is 8 o'clock, but I have, again, taken moderator privilege. We're going to do five more minutes. Um, because like Nigel said, this conversation is so, so very important. So I want to end with um, a question and then we'll do a quick little recap. Um, so it's a big question. So take whichever part of this question any of you all would like. And the question is um, specifically around young people. Of course, that's kind of the primary audience of Our Minds Matter. That's who we want to touch and positively affect. So how can young people bring awareness? How can young people create change? And also if there's a young person who, you know, needs um, or wants to find help, how does someone find help about, you know, all of these issues that we've been discussing here tonight? I just want to offer one thing quickly because it's tangible. So on the Acoma Project's website, we currently have a link, a banner at the top, acomaproject.org. And if young people go there, we have resources to support five free virtual sessions of therapy for the young people. So that if somebody's interested, they can go there and get that. Um, I think especially for, um, for youth who maybe don't know the first place to look, 
or to know like especially if maybe they don't they're not really placed they're not really in an environment that can like guide them to like what is going on I would generally just say don't be afraid to ask questions like ask questions like well, how are you feeling what is happening why is it happening understanding that taking the time I really truly feel like you know as um and I just said before the fact that mental health and like the black experience are just so intertwined it's truly and that for that reason I feel like mental health and recognizing that is empowering for youth and so definitely the first step would be asking those questions not be, looking for being aware that you deserve resources and help I think once that if you have like if you're able to develop that kind of drive that can really that can get you far even if other people are trying to say no or you don't need help or you don't need that education knowing that you deserve it that is so important another mic drop Sephora. <laughs> another mic drop wow okay amazing i i was gonna do like a recap with some key points i don't have key points everything was just so good um, but there will be an email that comes out for everyone that's been here tonight that will have some um, key points and additional information. Um, some of the resource, all, probably all, but at least uh, many of the resources that we've discussed um, here tonight as well. Um, I want to say thank you, of course, for everyone, um, not just to our panelists, you know, our panelists, yes, thank you, but also to everyone that's been here in the virtual room tonight. Um, amazing conversation. I don't wanna say this over and over again because I will be here for 10 minutes saying how amazing this was, but this was great. Um, so just a couple of um, final housekeeping items. Let's see here. Um, so like I said, email with resources and contact information for um, the uh, panelists here tonight. And also as a reminder, I wanna make sure that I um, state that if you or um, someone that you know is struggling with the mental health challenge, you can text CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, to 741741, and that's C-O-N-N-E-C-T to 741741, or you can call 1-800-273-8255, and help is always available if you need it by just calling 1-800-273-8255. And just like Sepla said, understand that you are valued, that you are worth every single ounce of being that you have and if you need help then it is absolutely okay and validating to seek it so um i saw a lot of feedback in the chat you know is there going to be a part two is this to be continued we'll see um i really really hope so personally um but with all of that thank you all again to the panelists nigel dr carruthers dr alfie sepla jordan um and also reverend brakeen thank you to um lauren anderson uh, Laura Beth Levitt, Catherine Royston, Rami Jackson, the whole Our Minds Matter crew um, for putting this together. Thank you to Dr. Leighton Armacon for being um, online with us as well tonight. So with that, I will send you all for the rest of your evening. Thank you so much and stay safe. Thank you for being an awesome moderator, Justin. Thank we you, just want to honor you. Thank you so much. Yes. Beautiful, beautifully done. Yes. Thanks for saying really well done. Thank you. Appreciate you all. <laughs>